All right. Hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions have been put on hold for a bit, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So welcome to season two of Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster Intriguing Interviews with Creative Minds. It's that time of year again when we, uh, oh, sorry, uh, with Halloween uh, soon upon us, I figured we should get a little dark and creepy. So welcome to Spooky Stories, where we'll be, and hang on a second, I had a little surprise for you. There we go. Where we'll be digging into goose, to, goal, to ghouls and ghosts and other terrifying creatures that go bump in the night. With us tonight is my old friend, Jim Chambers, who received the Bram Stoker Award for the graphic novel, Kolchak the Night Stalker, The Forgotten Lore of Edgar Allan Poe. He is also the author of the collection of The Night Border, described by Booklist as a haunting exploration of where the real world and nightmares collide. Hello, Jim. Hey, Russ. Great to be here. Say again? Great to be here, Russ. Good, good. Good to see you. All right. Also with, also with us tonight is Nadia Bolkin, who has been nominated five times for the Shirley Jackson Award. Hang on, and I've got some good stuff here. 13 of her stories appear in her debut collection, She Said Destroy, with others appearing in editions of this year's best weird fiction, this year's best horror, and this year's best dark horror and fiction. Hello, Nadia. Hi, everyone. All right. And finally, welcome my pal, Nicholas Kaufman, co-author of the best-selling horror novel, 100 Fathoms Below with Stephen Knight, uh, Stephen uh, L. Kent. Nick has been nominated, sorry, for the Bram Stoker Award, Shirley Jackson Award, Thriller Award, and a Dragon Award. Hello, Nick. Hey, how you doing? It's great to be here. All right, so a heads up for the folks at home. Feel free to send me notes or questions you may have from, uh, for the gang in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. Okay, so let's get right to it. Why do we love having the whole of, holy bejesus scared out of us? Nick, go for it. What do you got? Uh, well, the reason I'm laughing is, is uh, actually there are two reasons I'm laughing. One is, yes, I absolutely do love get, having the holy bejesus scared out of me. The other reason I'm laughing is because not everyone does. Uh, so I think that there's, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure it's, it's uh, genetic so much as a uh, um, personality thing, but uh, I've, I've always just been interested um, in monsters, really. Uh, that was where, that was my door into the scary stuff. So, you know, I, I watched the uh, Universal Monster movies when they would show them on TV when I was a kid and stuff like that. And I think I just got hooked. I think I just got hooked by this whole idea of, of the supernatural and the weird and, and, and monsters. Um, and I guess I've been chasing that high ever since. So Nani, what about you? Um, I'm, I think I'm one of those people who actually likes being scared a little bit less um, because I get really, really scared. Like I have to like hide in movie theaters like during jump scares. Like, I, and then my friends are like, they'll poke me and they'll be like, aren't you the horror writer? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> but you don't understand. Like, I am very susceptible to being startled. Um, but for me, I think it comes from it's like it's like more of a sort of like I like the trespass element of horror, and I like sort of you know how far can this be pushed. Um, and I, I guess I do like being scared, but at the same time, like sometimes I think people think that like what that means is that like you don't really get scared. But like, I get really scared. Like, I have to be convinced to go up a roller coaster as well. So well, I can't. I can't even go on roller coasters. That's all. Your show is named Roller Coaster. Yeah. So, 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 Jim. <laughs> so, Jim, I know you dabble in all sorts of, of 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 ghoulish types of thing. What about you? What's what what's kind of your interest in the macabre? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, you know, as far as having the holy bejesus scared out of me, I think it's probably just because I felt like I had too much bejesus to begin with. <laughs> so we had to get rid of some. But, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think about what first attracted me to horror. And I know it was a visual thing because I first discovered horror in comic books when I was a kid reading Tomb of Dracula and watching universal horror movies, uh, Nosferatu, the classic silent film and things like that. And uh, I was captivated visually and it really sparked my imagination. And I think that led me to read horror. And by the time I got to Clive Barker, uh, the books of blood where the, the horror fiction um, <clears throat> wasn't, it wasn't just about the horror. It was about other things. It was about these really lofty themes and social ideas and 
uh, human ideas. And uh, I just love the way that the darker stories can grapple with things in a more interesting and imaginative way. And I think that's what got me hooked. All right. So, so horror unto itself is kind of a broad term, right? We've got ghosts and demons and slashers and psychological horror and body horror and survival horror and environmental horror kind of so let's break it down a little bit. So what kind of defines them um, in these subgenres and unto themselves, what's the, what's either the, the, whether it's the gore or the scare or the, or the, the tension, what makes them distinct unto themselves? So let's start with you, Nick. Well, I think the, um, the question of what defines horror, whether in a, in a subgenre or overall, uh, is one that has been debated probably since uh, the turn of last century. Um, but I think if if I were to apply my own definition to what what this what what makes each of these uh, horror in particular, it would be that it is sort of an elevated sense of dread or terror, right? So there are plenty of movies where you might feel nervous, or there's suspense, there's 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 dread or terror, but it's not elevated. And I think it's horror is what elevates it uh, to a certain level and and uh, results in more of a an emotional reaction. If any of that makes sense. <laughs> well, so, well, Jim. So, let you know you you and I we've had many conversations about these kinds of things over the years. Um, you know, there's a difference. You could have you know, so a thrill. You could have a thriller without it being horror. You know, what kind of really? What's the horror? What kind of makes something horror? And let's kind of go into some of these sort of subgenres and just talk about a couple of them. Yeah, I think to kind of uh, play off what. What Nicholas was saying, I do think that, you know, the best horror creates that elevated sense of dread. It's fiction in any form, whether it's a film or, or prose or poetry, even that causes you to feel unease, to feel discomfort psychologically in some in some way, whether it's just a squeamishness, squeamish, sorry, squeamishness for body horror. Uh, something like that, where, you know, body horror is a subgenre where the, the, the horror arises from unexpected or unwanted changes uh, in your body or, or something along those lines. And, you know, that's sort of one end of the spectrum. And, and at the other end, you may have psychological horror, where it's just a matter of sort of presenting uh, the reality of very dark things that exist within the human mind or the human experience. And so, I like the idea of elevated horror or elevated dread because it's it's not just titillation in the sense of a jump scare. It's it's a jump scare that makes you think. So let me just just and I'll get to Nadia in a second. Um, so thinking about the psychological horror. So for those of us who watched, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the the Netflix series. Um, what was the 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 detective, the girl? Um, <laughs> Um, come on, not da Daredevil and um, Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones, right? So in the first season, you know, she is suffering from severe PTSD because Kinca Kincaid was that the villain? Kilgrave. Kilgrave. Sorry. I mean, that's. Would you call that element of that series horror? No, I wouldn't. I, I don't think I would either. Yeah, I, I would. I mean, there's certainly horrific elements to that to that story, but the overall thrust of the story is not horrific. It's not meant to induce dread so much as suspense and uh, a sense of mystery. So, 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 Nadia, so, um, so you're you're sort of a, a self-proclaimed scaredy cat, actually, for someone who writes horror. So, for you, so. Like we said, you know, so you've got ghosts, you got demons, slashers, and whatnot. So, what kind of um, what kind of horror is your is your jam? Like, what's what's your kind of horror? My jam, or what scares me the most? Both. Both. <laughs> okay, so what scares me the most? Hundred percent, angry ghosts. Angry ghosts. Uh, that's it. Um, things that don't scare me: serial killers you know, um, but still horror. Um, but yeah, angry ghosts. And I think it's because with a serial killer or even like a, you know, mass murderer, I feel like, okay, well, there's like, you know, you can try to do things. You can try to like throw things and like attack it or run. Can't do that with an angry ghost, especially if it's a Japanese style angry ghost. So it's like the utter lack of control. And for me, like that's part of a huge part of horror 
is that it ends the the ending the sort of like inevitable payment of a price for some kind of mistake that you made um whether it was just looking at a haunted house or whatever um and you can't escape it you can't escape your fate so that is a huge part of what horror is to me and what sort of creates um that sense of like dread and fear and all of that um so for me yeah like uh, curses that's also bad yeah so so where does for you so where does let's say sus, a, a suspense and thrillers where does that end and horror begin you know there's got to be there's probably some sort of gray area in between them what kind of gets us into the red zone so jim i think it's uh very often it's where you cross the line from the ordinary to the weird is when you become a horror you know it becomes horror uh, a thriller a suspense story there's a lot of action there's a lot of edge of your seat is this what's going to happen next is the hero going to survive is the uh, the, um, the plot going to be foiled or whatever the you know the the um, just of the story is and to some extent a lot of that is in the control is in the control of normal everyday life um, and I think when you know I like the idea that Nadia brought up of, of the lack of control, it's you, you can't run from an angry ghost or something like that. It starts to move out of that realm of the ordinary into the weird, into the, the you know, the, the supernatural, the, um, the kind of thing that's just beyond, uh, beyond your ability to affect directly. So for you, the horror aspect is the, the, la the lack of, con is the lack of control that's one aspect of horror, yes. So what? So for you, so let, let's look at from both points of view. So as a as a reader and a viewer, what 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 either terrifies you or or what draws you in as on the spectator the, on the reader spectator side? And we'll get to the writing side next. Um, you know, it, it's not horror that draws me into a story as a reader. It's it's other things. Uh, it's characters that engage me in a story that draw me in. It's ideas that draw me in. And when those characters and ideas involve horror, uh, you know, I enjoy that. Um, but I, I don't think horror on its own is appealing to me. Right. It's more about what right. horror can reveal right. about uh, about something. Okay, so, I, but let, let's go back to that just a minute. So, but why the horror aspect of it as opposed to like a thriller aspect of it what's i'm trying to get into like that real deep that underbelly of what when you cross that line what is that extra layer of whether it's uh, a psychological torture or helplessness or whatever it is what appeals to you about that it's i guess compared to thrillers it's pretty simple i you know most thrillers end with somebody shooting somebody else to stop them from doing something bad or capturing the bad guy or um you know on on exposing the secrets of the conspiracy or something like that and that stuff is great but it's also very it's very mundane compared to what you can experience or what you can read about or write about in horror you know, there's a lot more that you can bring to the table, I think, with a horror story, because there's more opportunity to layer in uh, different types, different themes and different ideas uh, in a way that I find much more interesting. And it may just be the way I'm wired. Yeah. Nick? Uh, I, I actually, uh, I agree with that. And I want to piggyback off of what James said. Um, thrillers tend to end with the status quo being um, protected and resumed. The, the threat is over, the serial killer has been captured or killed, the conspiracy is done, uh, and the status quo is protected. Horror stories tend to end with a new status quo. That's a good, in my opinion, good horror stories end with a new status quo. Um, uh, we can take um, the movie Hereditary as a good example of this. Um, if this were just um, a thriller, um, you know, the son would defeat the, the, the cultists and he would get away or whatever. Um, but it's not, it's a horror movie. So something completely new is happening at the end, a completely new status quo for this family, for these people, uh, for this, for this poor, the poor son <laughs> of this family. Um, uh, and I think that's what draws me to it. I think what I really like about horror is that the story ends in a different place than where it starts. Um, whereas so many other genres, in particular uh, thrillers, tend to end back at the start. 
Um, so for me, I don't know, I, I think I just like that horror means things change. And maybe that's just a personal thing. Maybe I feel that there's so much in the world that could use a change that I, that I am drawn to this, um, but it, 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 it works for me. So underneath it all, what, whatever we're talking about, right? Whether, whatever this is, the genre of, of horror may be, there's some, there's a, a, a delving into some sort of darkness, right? There's kind of, kind of the exploration of whether it's character, personality, situation that is so far beyond um, what we typically experience, sort of, you know, it, it breaks us out of our stasis um, to a degree that unsettles us to the point where we're almost not sure how to be. Uh, you know, it's, it's truly unsettling and it's sort of, um, uh, you know, it's sort of, a, it's, a, it's a real test of, it almost seems like to deal with these horrific situations, it's a true test of, it's a true test of character. Right, to, to deal with the, them. If you're, if you're being hunted by some if, some, if some ghost decides to come by and, you know, decides to have its way with you, you know, like you said, you know, you can't just pull out a new, you can't just pull out the, uh, you know, you can't go to your gun closet and, and do your thing. I mean, you could, you could probably break off a few rounds. I don't know if it's going to do much besides, you know, shoot a few uh, lamps. So what is it about the, um, the need to sort of um, find other ways far beyond our, our experience to deal with it? What, what's that? for you, Nadia. Yeah, and I think that is actually part of also why I'm drawn to horror is because I think a lot of horror fans um, have like trauma backgrounds. And I think that there is a real sort of like, what horror gives them is like, look, this is a terrible situation that someone else, this character is living through. And you get to sort of expose yourself to danger, even mortal danger even like in incredible loss, you know? Um, and you see this character, you know, think this is the end for me. I, there's no way I can get out of this, you know? And, you know, maybe some, maybe they're right or maybe they pull through somehow. But I think that it's like a little form of like exposure therapy for people who either have gone through really terrible things or are afraid that they will. Um, so I think that there's a, a really big element of sort of like, exploring the limits within yourself and I think you especially get this within you know survival horror genre where or like you know in the wilderness and whatever um, but I think it's a, a factor within all types of horror and I think you get that by the sort of you know the, the sort of popular opinion popular sort of interpretation of horror movies where it's like don't go in the basement don't do something alone like it's all kind of like this test of like making it through life through like dangerous scenarios and horror is like a way to kind of play with various choose your own adventure um mm -hmm. hazardous minefields it's kind of how i would so it. just just for if for no one else for me um so how do you define survival horror I would, so my classic definition of survival horror is like this, one of my favorite movies is called Backcountry, where this um, woman and her fiance go off into the, um, into the forest or whatever, and they're being stalked by a bear. So for me, survival horror is like, it's not about a human villain. It's not, it's, it's like, it's, you know, it, it's man versus nature. So if you're, Cujo? Yep. Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's 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 man versus environment. Okay, all right. Okay, so I, I have to ask because it's not generally my type of thing. What is the appeal as, about zombies? You got to help me understand this one. I think zombies. The appeal of zombies is that uh, zombies are basically us. Um, you know, uh, when uh, George Romero made Night of the Living Dead in 1967 or 68. Um, his idea was not uh, just simply here are some ghouls who have returned from the grave and are going to eat people. His idea was um, this is a revolution. This is the the uh, the new generation rising up and devouring the old generation. So I think zombies in particular, because they are us, are really great for metaphor. And so I think that really resonates with a lot of horror fans. Zombies can represent revolution. They can represent consumerism run rampant. They can represent the mob 
just the mindless mob. So I think I think people like that. And also, I mean, not to put put too fine a point on it, but I think some people really like the makeup. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they just love seeing like the, the gore makeup. I, I'm not above that. <laughs> you should see some of the movies in my collection. Jim, what about you? Yeah, I think I think uh, Nicholas hit the nail on the head with that. And I would add that there, I, I think there's a certain element to interest in zombies that's not not entirely positive, and that's that it it does strike a chord with that sort of primitive us or versus them uh, instinct in, in that we all have. And you know, zombies are the ultimate other; they are us. But it's okay if we shoot them in the head. <laughs> so, you know, they're a stand-in for a lot of uh, social frustration, I think, and that's a theme that you know has become more prominent in zombie film and fiction in probably in the 21st century than it was in the 20th century. Mm. Um, and it's fun, you know, my initial interest in zombies, when I discovered them, I was, I was maybe, you know, just heading into high school. And at that point, I was fascinated with anything gory, creepy, decomposed skulls, that kind of thing. And so it was a visual thing, like the makeup, as Nick said. Um, and the first zombie movie I saw, I think was Dawn of the Dead. And that's, that's one gory, crazy movie. Um, but as you know, as I grew older, I understood them on a different level, and I really do think there's a certain unhealthy aspect to our fascination with <laughs> zombies. But I, I, it doesn't make me enjoy them any less. So I mean, I read the first, let's say, fifty or so issues of The Walking Dead when it was out in comics, and um, you know, not being a zombie guy, really. I mean, when you when you read it, it's really not about the zombies. It's sort of the zombies kind of force. Um, forced the surviving humans to discover almost the monsters within themselves are confronted with the monsters within themselves. Um, I haven't watched the show, so I don't have an opinion about it, but that's kind of what, um, although it was a little relentlessly bleak for my taste, because um, ultimately, you know, it's just, if you're living in a zombie apocalypse that doesn't end, well, it's just not going to end well, but to sort of the constant confrontations with having to deal with the zombies really could have been a stand-in for anything it could have been a pandemic it could have been uh a, you know any kind of an apocalypse or a, a natural disaster where you're just kind of fending for yourselves a little bit like um it was almost just like a more uh horrifying version of um of um oh god why am i drawing a blank when the kids are on the island they're marooned on the island the kids um lord of the flies lord of the flies right now man, man against himself mm -hmm. Well, zombies are very much a force of nature, right? And I mean, zombies. they're not—they're not evil. The zombie isn't uh, after you because uh, it's evil, because it has a malignant idea in its head. It just wants to eat. It's a force of nature. It, it could easily be a, a starving lion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, let me ask you guys. So, we're talking about things that are terrifying or that kind of challenge us beyond the norm. So, how does horror fiction stay relevant in a time? like now in a pandemic when so much of reality just terrifies us on a, on, on to some degree in every waking moment. Jim. Well, I, you know, I think the relevance of horror fiction, especially in trying times remains basically the same in some ways, uh, particularly in that it allows us a safety valve, a safe way to confront and deal with things that frighten us. Uh, you can read a horror novel, you can watch a horror movie and be frightened for a few hours, knowing that you're not in any real danger. And, you know, I think that that's valuable, even when the outside world is coming, you know, with horrors knocking at your door. It's a welcome distraction. It's also a way to develop, um, to some extent, you know, think about how to cope with horror, how to, how to cope with fear. Uh, there was an interesting, I, I have no idea the validity of the study behind this, but there was an interesting article floating around the internet the last couple of months where uh, horror fans or people who like horror movies are proving more resilient uh, through, you know, the pandemic and things like that. And uh, so, you know, I think there's something there to, to just kind of um, that, you know, it's like the Grimm's fairy tale uh, effect. It's they're there to, to help you prepare for or understand and cope with the really scary stuff that's real. Mm -hmm. Nadia? I think it's also like um, a remind, like I found myself like, I can't watch zombie movies right now. I can't, you know, watch like plague horror um, such as it is, um, but I'm loving ghost movies, um, haunted houses. I think sometimes there's like a reminder that horror fiction can pose that like, 
you are human in other ways than you're consciously thinking of right now, which is like sort of like as a disempowered citizen, um, as a someone who's trapped in their house. Like, I don't know, like, I think, I think there's, I think horror can like expand, expand horizons in a way and also sort of overturn assumptions that people have. And I think that that's a value, like even, even when we're surrounded by horror, you're maybe not necessarily uncovering every stone or the source of every horror or, you know, like I would love to re read some like pandemic set thing that's like, I'm trapped in my house and I've just discovered there's a ghost in it, you know? I mean, why not? It's like fun and topical and it's something a little bit different than what we're actually worrying about with like the disease. So let me ask you guys, so what's some of the, and Nick, let me, let me start with you. So what's some of the best recent works of horrors that you would recommend, um, something that you didn't write, uh, that you think horror fans should check out? Oh, thank you. Um, well, uh, I think um, if people are not yet familiar with Nathan Ballingrud, um, his most recent collection came out, I want to say last year, but it might have been two years ago, because time has no meaning anymore. Uh, it's called Wounds. Uh, it was very, very good. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I've been a big fan of Paul Tremblay's work uh, since uh, his City Pier stories back in the early 2000s. Uh, and so his latest one, um, Survivor Song, is excellent. You may not want to read it right now because it is a pandemic story. Um, uh, in fact, I had received an arc. I won a contest and re received an arc of that one back in February. And I was like, okay, you know, around mid-March, I was like, okay, this one's next on my list. And then COVID happened and I was like, I can't, I can't, I cannot read the, uh, a novel about a pandemic while a pandemic is <laughs> happening. And it actually took me until I think August uh, to finally get around to it. Um, uh, and it's excellent, but again, you may not want to, you may not want to deal with it right now. Yeah. Um, Jimmy, how about you? Uh, there's a couple of novels I've read this year that I think are really outstanding. One is uh, Stephen Graham Jones, the Only Good Indians, uh, which is um, a little bit in the vein, Nadia, I think of the angry ghost kind of idea that you were talking about earlier, but uh, from a Native American perspective. And uh, he's a great writer uh, and it's a meaty story. Um, there's a lot to it. Uh, the other novel that I read that I really think is outstanding so far this year is uh, The Children of Red Peak by Craig DeLuey, which is coming out next month. And it's, a, it's um, it's about uh, a group of kids who survived a religious cult that either uh, committed mass suicide or legitimately disappeared into another reality. And you don't really know which um, for the, uh, the, the most of the, the story, but um, they're fascinating characters and the mythology behind it is really uh, engaging. And the whole psychology of that kind of life, I found fascinating and Craig did a great job with it. Nani, what about you? Um, well, I totally support those, um, recommendations. Uh, also want to flag Victor Laval, all of any and all of his work. Um, and I had the sort of privilege of being on the Shirley Jackson Award Committee, um, in order to read his Ballad of Black Tom. Um, so that's a really good one. And it's also, it's like Lovecraftian, so it's a little bit different. You know, it's not, not plaguey. Um, there's um, Alma Kapu, um, The Deep, and um, The Hunger. Um, the Hunger might be a little bit plaguey, but it's like old plaguey, so I think it's better. Um, and then would also add um, Carmen Maria Machado. Um, her collection, Her Body and Other Parties, um, it's excellent. Um, so just to kind of layer out the, you know, add some women in there. All right. So you, you mentioned something I wanted to get to it. So we'll do it now. So let's talk about Lovecraft for a minute. You know, obviously, uh, again, I don't read Lovecraft, so I'm not, I have no comment or opinion about his work, but clearly influential for sure. So, uh, I mean, I've seen obviously representations of it and the artwork is sort of rather grotesque and disturbing and fascinating. So what is it about sort of that Lovecraftian, you know, that, you know, being on the border of dimension, horrifying dimensions that, you know, what, what's that, what's that thrill? What's that appeal? Jim? Well, I, th I think it's the, uh, the 
appeal of cosmic horror in general. And while Lovecraft may be the, uh, the most popularly known practitioner of cosmic horror, he didn't really invent it uh, wholesale. There were a lot of predecessors and people who followed him that really developed that idea. And the, the essential idea of cosmic horror is the, the dread that comes in realizing that we live in a universe or exist in a universe where we, we really don't matter. Um, where there are powers far greater than than us, right. and they can wipe us out anytime. Nadia, yeah, I think it's the same part of um, part of the brain that's that's appe appeals to, oh gosh, that is attracted to like the Alien series, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's also like the the curiosity killed the cat part of the brain. Um, I think that people especially in reading this, at least for me, like there's this sense of like, whoa, this is so far beyond your average like serial killer. This is like some gonna be something really big and really huge and like mind altering. Um, and I think people look for that at the same time while they know that like the protagonist of these stories is doing the same thing and is going to like die um, as a result of that curiosity. But I think it's like a safe way for us to be like, I'm curious, I wanna see what that, what that is. So, so you said something that was actually one of my next questions, so I want to get into it. So just for a minute, um, I want to talk about kind of like sci-fi horror. You know, in particular, things, movies like the, the remake, The Thing, Alien, Event Horizon. Um, what's the appeal of that kind of horror? Nick? I think it plays into the same thing that Lovecraftian or cosmic horror does, which is that uh, it's sort of the thrill of the unknown. Right. If you're, you know, let's imagine you're half asleep in your bedroom and you hear a strange sound coming from behind your closet door. You walk up to the closet door, you open it. It could be something as harmless as your cat got stuck in there, or it could be something really scary. This kind of horror brings you right up to the door, but doesn't necessarily open it. Right. So you're left with that sort of thrill of the unknown. And certainly when you go out into space, you don't know. What's, you know, one of the great things about Event Horizon is just that it's like, you don't know what the hell's happening out here in space. It's crazy. It's madness. It's going to drive you crazy. You're going to carve your eyes out and, and you know, drive the ship into a black hole. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just, it's thrilling because it's so much about the unknown. And also because I think it's so much um, uh, not familiar, right? There's, there are so many familiar horrors now. Um, if you have a story about a werewolf, everyone kind of knows what a werewolf is. But in space, in the vastness of space, we have no idea what's waiting out there. And that can be really exciting. Jim? Uh, yeah, I think science fiction horror is, uh, you know, it's, it's the, um, the, the, pos the prospect that these horrific things could be real, could exist in the natural world. Uh, it takes the supernatural element out of the equation. And so alien is now a life form that we could encounter and have to contend with to, you know, continue surviving in the universe. I mean, is, there's, is there sort of a, you know, so in particular things like, so like, the, like, especially the remake of the thing and alien, there's a very real, you know, sort of a mutated gore element within that, you know, that sci-fi world. I mean, you know, it's actually, The Thing is one of the few sort of like horror movies I can actually watch because um, it's just so fascinating and cool. Um, is it sort of the, you know, almost like we're, 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 we're tampering with things that we shouldn't be or that something or somewhere, something, with the, whether it's the universe or other creatures or whatever, they've tampered with the, I don't know, it's almost like they've, they've messed with us on a cellular level which is just going to mutate us into something beyond us. And is it sort of that whatever those things are, it's sort of like some distorted mirror of what we could be? Yeah, I think kind of. And what that really reminds me of actually is Annihilation, um, where there's like sort of actual like genetic changes. And I remember um, that being the most terrifying part of that story for me was like the idea that we could you could literally be transforming into something else. Um, and I think that that's also a very strong element within Lovecraftian fiction. But I mean, what, what greater sort of source of fear than literally being sort of replaced without even really knowing it? Mm. Something that is beyond your consciousness. I mean, that All is- All right, so speak, speaking of 
um, sci-fi uh, sci horror. I want to do. I'm going to do a quick share screen. This is. I want to give. A, I want to give a shout out to um, to my pal uh, Sonny Hatton, who I know Nick knows, who has a, a really intense collection of sci-fi horror. Uh, so what has two uh, two heads, ten eyes, and terrifying table manners? Uh, so this is a collection of sci-fi horror that he that he edited, and uh, I've gotten a sneak peek, and um, it was not a good idea that I did. Um, so sci-fi horrifying things is is your thing. I wanted to give a, a little shout out to Sony, and I recommend that you check it out. Okay, so um, now, so we were talking about movies, and again, I'm not a huge horror guy. However, Nightmare on Elm Street, Creep Show. An American Werewolf in London, Poltergeist, and even Jaws, in a way, stick out for me, not just even as great horror movies, but they're great movies. So kind of what's your take on them? And what other, what other movies do you consider to be horror classics, including anything recent? Nick? Uh, I love all of those movies that you mentioned. And I think uh, what really stands out for most of them uh, is the character work. I think we, we really care about that family in Poltergeist. Um, uh, to some extent, we care about uh, Nancy in um, an America in uh, um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, um, and want her to to be okay. Um, an American Werewolf in London, also great character work and so funny. Like it's there's such yes. wonderful character based humor in there. Um, so I love all of those, uh, and I would add to that list actually as one of my favorites, um, uh, Return of the Living Dead, um, which is sort of semi-sequel, semi-spoof of uh, Romero's Living Dead movies, um, which uh, is, it's a zombie movie. Um, it features a, a cast of uh, amazing characters, many of which are just our 80s punks. Uh, it's got a great soundtrack and it's very, very funny. It's a very witty script by Dan O'Bannon, the same guy who wrote Alien. Yeah. Jim, what about you? Yeah, all of those are on my list too. Uh, I'm glad that Return of the Living Dead got mentioned. Um, one of my favorite classic horror movies is The Haunting, the, the Robert Wise version, not the, uh, the 90s remake, which was, <laughs> which was horrible. Um, but the, it's based on The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. And it's, uh, it's a horror movie with very, very few, if any, visual special effects, but a ton of great cinematography and audio effects that just make it incredibly creepy. Um, and from recent movies, uh, the, the last horror movie I saw recently that actually got under my skin was Hereditary. And it's not the ultimate horror in the movie that got to me. It's, it's a pivotal point in the story that occurs earlier in the film that uh, caught me so off guard, I almost stopped watching it. And I can't remember the last time I almost stopped watching a horror movie. <laughs> wow. Nadia, how about you? So I interesting because I wasn't I didn't grow up in the United States and I missed a lot of that sort of like the classic horrors um so I've seen them sort of like as adults sometimes and sometimes it works and sometimes it works less well um I would add however um for me at least The Shining um probably like The Omen, Exorcist, maybe like Don't Look Now, Suspiria um for me it's kind of like I think, I think when I think of like classic, like horror classics, what I think of is something that sort of like is so, taps into something that's part of the culture. Um, so you sort of instinctively kind of have this sense that like, this is like a timeless touchstone kind of movie. And what I think of as a recent addition to that is It Follows, because I felt like instantly I was like, yep, classic American horror movie. like. It just is, it, it's like tropish. It's just tropish enough to be so instantly recognizable for anybody who's like, you know, steeped in the culture, but also like does its own thing enough to be memorable. Well, I love the fact that we're talking about movies that terrify us while, while Nadia is snuggling with a black cat. I'm sorry. She's, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, quick interlude for the folks who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments, for the panel, we're gonna get, send them in the chat box and we're gonna to get to a whole bunch of them at the end. Okay, that was great. But now it's time for a special segment of the show where we spin the wheel. On the wheel are seven categories and wherever it lands, the categories is the, uh, wherever it lands is what you get. The categories are, and I built them special for this week. 
Freddy versus Jason, Silence of the Lambs, Strangers in a Strange Land, Fear of Flying, Trick or Treat, Music to My Fears, and The Reanimator. Okay, you ready? Nick, you're up first. All right. Do it. Do it. Spin that wheel. Spin that there we wheel. Go. Spin. Spin it. You ready? No whammies. No whammies. <laughs> okay. Stranger in a Strange Land. Okay. So you pred predominantly write horror. Um, what genre outside of horror would you like to write that you have not already written? Wow, great, uh, great question. I have, I've dabbled also in urban fantasy and I'd like to uh, try my hand at science fiction. Um, my problem is that I'm not very science oriented. Uh, so I think it would be more like space opera where it's just like the, the spaceships just go. They just fly. I don't know how it works. <laughs> they just do it. People have laser guns, whatever, right? Oh. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Nadia, you ready? You're up? Okay, ready. You ready? Here we go. All right, here we go. What do we got? Wherever it lands is what you get. All right, and you got, okay, music to my fears. Oh, okay. 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 Now, so what is this one? All right, music to my fears is, oh, hold on, where is it? Uh, okay, um, what's one piece of music oh, God. or song that creeps you out every time you hear it? Wow, that's a great question. And okay, so I'm, I, I feel like I could answer that with like a regular song, but I don't think I will because I think the one the one time <laughs> what immediately popped into my head is this song that was used in Sinister in the end credits of Sinister. And it's called like uh I think the band is called like Gyroscope or something like that. But it's like this, it's it's like this like doom 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 doom. It's like really scary and weird. And it brought one day it popped up on my Spotify without my looking for it. And I was like, what is this? like get out of my ears. So say that, what's it called again? Let me look it up. Hang on, I'm sorry. That's all right, we'll come, we'll come back to you. No. Okay. okay, no, don't worry, you, you find it. We'll, we'll get the name, don't worry, I promise. So Jim, you ready? All right, let's do it. All right, Jimmy, come on, let's go. Let's spin that wheel. Oh, no, here, you're gonna get the next one. All right, Freddy versus Jason. Okay, I'm not sure that anyone would consider this a horror uh, mashup classic, but if you could choose any two horror franchises to have a mashup that haven't been done already, what would they be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, wow. Because a lot of them have been done. <laughs> There's so many of them. I have, to, I have to really give this some thought. I mean, we could go with something really wild like Dracula versus Predator. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I, I love mean, it. <laughs> I have no idea what that would look like, but I would buy a ticket in advance. <laughs> sure, it wouldn't. All right. All right. That was great. Okay. So, look, we're all in the writing business. So, let's go to our advice column. All right. Uh, Jim, since you're here, we're going to start with you. Uh, and I know you and I have had this conversation many, many times over the years. What's the best and worst writing advice someone ever gave you or advice you overheard? Uh, I'd say the best advice I've ever gotten for writing is read. Uh, you know, if you want to be a writer, read. You have to read a lot. You have to read widely. You have to read constantly. Uh, I've met writers who don't read, and I don't know how they do it, but I think that's the best piece of advice I've gotten, and it has uh, served me well. Uh, the worst piece, write what you know, um, you know, in a literal sense, at least, because I write horror fiction. I write fantasy, science fiction. I, you know, these are all things I'm making up, and so to write what I know would, would be very limiting considering, you know, none of these things exist. All right, Nick, what do you got? The worst piece of writing advice I ever heard was one I heard recently. Uh, I sort of fell down the rabbit hole of booktube uh, being stuck at home and, you know, in front of my computer all day. Uh, and booktube is filled with people who review books constantly on, uh, you know, on YouTube, but some of them are also writers. Um, and so they, they also do writing advice. And the worst writing advice I heard recently from somebody on YouTube was said is dead. And what that means is for dialogue tags, you no longer use the word said, you use every fancy word you can imagine instead of said. And I believe 
fully in the exact opposite of that. Wow. Yeah, that is a stupid advice. Wow. It's terrible. I don't know if this is coming out of a grad school or just somebody on a message board somewhere who wanted to mess with new writers, but said is most definitely not dead. Oof. No. Okay. Uh, in terms of writing advice that I have always uh, thought was very good, um, in addition to what James said about reading, uh, which is an e is excellent advice, um, is just uh, write as often as you can. Put your butt in your chair and write as often as you can. Maybe it's not every day. I don't want to put pressure on anyone. Uh, but even if you can squeeze in half an hour at some point, you know, between coming home and dinner or what have you, um, just keep at it because I firmly believe that the more you write, the better you get. And with you improve with every single word you put down. All right, Nadia. Um, so I think the best advice I've heard is that the idea that you need to learn the rules, you need to know the rules in order to know how to break them. Um, I think I, I've heard this like said regarding like Cormac McCarthy um, because people then are like, why, why do, I, do I have to use, you know, said or whatever right um but i think the and i think this goes back to read a lot because i think that is the, the easiest way of knowing like sort of what the rules are um but i think you need to know why the rules were there in order to then break them which i think you should and i think like if anything that's what i wish what was done more in horror was more um stylistic rule breaking um because I think that's that's part of the horror and part of unsettling um, that we we should be trying to do a little bit more of. All right. Um, okay. Yeah. So so normally I would keep going, but I'm gonna have to give you the I'm gonna have to give you the hook. So um, we're gonna take some questions from uh, from the audience here. So we, and we got a lot to get to. So we were gonna talk about this before, and I'm glad someone brought it up. So um, we were gonna talk. A lot of you guys write you write a lot of um, short fiction in horror. So they're asking, so it's a, it's a, it's a two-sided question. One is, um, what's your take on long form versus short form of horror? And part two, what collections of short form would you recommend? Jimmy. Uh, I, I generally favor short form for horror fiction because it's more immediate in a sense. Uh, it's easier to sustain a sense of dread over a short story or a novella than it is over a novel length piece. Um, that said, there are plenty of novels I've read that just get under your skin and stay there for the entire length of the book. So, you know, I think it, you have to find the right form for the, for the story and that let that dictate how you do it. Um, for collections or anthologies, um, you know, I, I haven't even read it yet, but it just came out. Uh, Ellen Datlow's latest best uh, year's best horror uh, was just released, I think this month. And uh, I've read many of those in the past and they've never disappointed. So it's a great place to start. Nadia? Um, yeah, I would agree that short form is honestly a lot easier. Um, and I think that you can get away with a lot more open-endedness in short form horror that I think when you get into a novel, there's like an expectation, I think partly on just the reader, that there's going, everything will be explained. And I don't think that you uh, necessarily are bound to that so much in short form. So you can be a little more experimental is what I would say. Well, follow up question, Nick, why don't you take this one? So the question is, how can you tell if your horror story is working? Oh boy, uh, I think that's so intuitive. It's hard to describe, uh, but I think, um, I mean, it, it's very rare that you're gonna scare yourself, right? When you're writing a story, because you know what you're doing, you know what you're trying to go for. You can't surprise yourself. Uh, but I think you know uh, if, if a horror story is working, um, if it's not fighting you as the writer, uh, if, it, if it's just, you know, I've had plenty of, of times where I've sat down in front of a, a, a document and it's just not coming. Like I'm trying to write and it's just fighting me and I realize that something's not working uh, and I have to go back and find out what that is. I wish I had more of a mechanical answer that you know that one can apply, but really it is just sort of intuitive. And if you find yourself struggling to, to move from point A to point B, struggling as I put it to, to move, make your character walk from the kitchen to the front door, something still needs to happen in the kitchen. So, all right, so let me ask you something. So a question that came up. So I don't do this a lot when I write sometimes, but not a lot. Um, but mood is really, I would assume critical in horror. Do you guys listen to music 
while you're writing horror to inspire it? I'm getting I'm getting a, a big a big head bob from Nick, so I'll go. Oh with Nick. yeah, absolutely. I don't I don't want to take time away from the others because I just yeah. spoke about the other question. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I I love to write to music. Uh, I tend to try to write to music that does not have lyrics. You mean like this? Uh, Not, <laughs> not the uh, the the fugue, but <laughs> I I do find like I just I I recently discovered the joys of uh, something called um, what is it dark um, dark ambient music or something like that where it's just like it's just it's 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 dark and spooky and mood building but there's no lyrics and there are no major chord or tone changes to distract you and you can just write to that for hours. Nick, uh, Jane, what about you? Yeah, I often listen to music when I'm writing. Sometimes it's to set the mood. Sometimes it's just white noise to block out distractions. Uh, I do a lot of my writing, uh, or I, I did until everything shut down earlier this year, but I did a lot of my writing on the train. So I would listen to loud music or I would listen to mm -hmm. music uh, like Philip Glass soundtracks and things like that that are, are moody, but also have, have a, like a, a buffering effect on the real world. Okay, fair enough. All right, so guys, so this was great. So now it's time for a little shameless promotion. Okay, so hold on, give me a second. We're gonna do another shared screen here. All right, because I'm, 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 I'm all prepared for what I got here. All right, so uh, hold on, sorry, give me one second. Okay, so oh. there we go. That looks familiar. Yes, so, so, so Nick, tell us what you got. Yeah, so this is actually my, my most recent book and uh, this is great timing because it is currently on sale as an ebook for just 99 cents this week. Um, uh, and uh, so that's a, that's a great uh, deal. And it actually, uh, this weekend, because of the sale, it actually reached number three, I think, in all of US horror. Awesome. Uh, which is pretty cool. And number one in, in vampire thrillers, which is a category I didn't know existed. What's the, what's uh, the gist of it? Well, this is, uh, the log line is vampires on a submarine. Uh, it's, uh, it's 1984. It's, um, the middle of the Cold War, you've got a U.S. nuclear sub that's trapped in Soviet waters on a secret mission, and there's a vampire on board, picking people off one by one. So it's so it's basically like aliens underwater. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, what what I was what we what Steve and I were going for was more. Um, sort of, uh, you know, the hunt for Red, Op Red October yeah. meets uh, Salem's Lot. Oh, perfect. There you go. Hooked. All right. Great. OK, what do we got? What do we got next? Hold on, Jimmy. On the Night Border, this is uh, my collection, my most recent collection of horror fiction published by Raw Dog Screaming Press uh, last year. And it's it's a great um, sort of variety of horror stories. I, I, I tried to kind of mix things up when I assembled it and uh, a lot of different types of horror types of um, story structures and things that are going on in there. So I, I hope if anyone checks it out, they enjoy it. So what kind of, what are some of the, uh, the subgenres of, of horror that are in this one? Uh, there's historical horror fiction. I wrote it. Uh, the lead story is about my hometown uh, or where I'm living now, uh, where Jack Kerouac lived for a time in the 60s and it sort of uh connects to cosmic horror that i've i've written about set in the same location um and some of the other stories are modern horror uh there's at least one um sort of weird uh psychological horror story and it also uh thanks to the kind people who gave me permission reprints uh one of my kolchak the night stalker short stories right on okay and nadia what do we get what do we got so this is my collection. Um, I am, I am a, a newbie or a writer, sort of. Um, so that's all I got is my collection. Um, the theme is socio-political horror, which means like horror with a political undercurrent, sort of. Um, and I would say in terms of themes, we've got ghosts, we've got Lovecraft, we've got some demons. Um, and those are the main ones. Some, yeah, yeah. So. Let's, let's, let's offer for, you know, various different people. All right. Sounds good. Okay. And as for me, uh, while mine is not 
strict horror per se, Murder Montague Falls is a collection of three noir novellas with touches of horror written by Sonny Hatton, Patrick Thomas, and yours truly. The novellas all feature teen protagonists and are set in the same fictional town across three, de three different decades and are all set on or around Halloween. Each story explores different elements of the criminal mind, including cult rituals, secret spies, and serial murders. And hot off the press is my new novel, Crackle and Fire, featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick, who is hired to find a missing intern with stolen corporate files, but soon finds herself tackling with dueling gangsters, angry protesters, and a madman from Earth with galactic ambitions of his own. Crackle and Fire and Murder in Montague Falls are available on Amazon and published by Crazy Eight Press. All right, guys, uh, hang on. This was a great hour. I want to I want to thank everyone uh, for being here. I want to thank Jim, Nadia, and Nick for a great show, and to everyone who's watching at home, happy Halloween! And I will see all Hold of you on. guys. Russ, wait, we've got to we've got to hear the song. Nadia, what was? Oh the yeah, oh yeah. Wait, you got the song? Yes, I do. What is it? Share it. I'm playing it, but it might be really. I can't hear. What's it called? No. It's on Gyroscope. Gyroscope? Gyroscope by Boards of Canada. Can you hear right. it? Okay. All right, Gyroscope. All right, good. We'll look yeah. for it. So to everyone, happy Halloween. Be safe. And I'll see you guys next week with a whole panel on Batman the Dark Knight. All right, take care, guys. Bye now.